All right, so I'll do the abridged short version of who I am. So I'm Christoph Dorbeck, Solutions Architect for Red Hat. Um, I've been with Red Hat for 15 years now, as it turns out, as of last week. Uh, I've been working with Blue for years before that, so I'm going to say probably around 20 years so far. Um, in any case, uh, I'm here to talk to you today about Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8. Uh, if you're a CentOS user, then anything here should probably apply to uh, CentOS 8. Uh, we had a conversation last month uh, about the changes to CentOS and what that's all about. Um, I'm not planning to cover any of those materials here today. This is strictly focused on kind of you're a RHEL or CentOS administrator, you're considering moving and uh, switching to RHEL 8. What do you need to know? So that's kind of the, the focus with today's uh, presentation. So the materials today um, are primarily just very plain vanilla slides. Um, I do have, have a live environment working in the background here. So we're gonna kind of jump back and forth between slides and demo. Um, this is a reduced version of the Rollite hands-on workshop that I developed for Red Hat Summit. And that is available open source in my GitHub account. So the URL is listed there at the top. Um, the slide deck here, you'll, you know, we're gonna go through a lot of content and then a, it's gonna turn into kind of just outline blanks where I'm still filling in materials. Uh, but in any case, we'll be able to cover all the topics and discuss what we need to. Um, all the material here was assembled from publicly available information. So there's no concerns about NDA content or anything here. Um, and this is also, you know, provided in community spirit and just wanting to share information. Um, Talk about the demos. I'm very eager to hear any feedback if uh, you folks have other observations about RHEL 8, good or bad, that you'd like or would see a benefit to have it included, happy to do so. So, uh, believe it or not, we're already coming up on two years old for RHEL 8. Um, originally released on May 7th in 2019, uh, the scheduled end of quote unquote full support is 2024. And then the end of standard maintenance support is 2029. Um, for RHEL product releases, they go through these life cycles where um, under full support basically means that there's going to be new feature enhancements. You're going to get new driver updates, hardware compatibility. Like it's going to be actively maintained and also expanded in its feature set. Um, at the end of full support, it basically goes into kind of a maintenance mode where new advanced capabilities or feature updates are restricted. And it's really just about uh, security and bug fixes going forward. Um, Red Hat also has um, different support models called extended update support and extended life support to ad address different use cases for customers that need, you know, a, a different pace of, re of releases. Um, in any case, I'm not gonna go into that. Just uh, you can check it all out at the uh, the link in the bottom here where the Red Hat Enterprise Linux lifecycle is, uh, is linked to. Um, in any case, one of the key things about RHEL 8 that was different when it came out was that we're adhering to a very rigid six month release schedule. So in the past where you had RHEL 567, you typically had the GA release um, and then, you know, the, the next dot releases would be six to nine months later. Sometimes it'd be a year later. Um, Red Hat as an, as an organization is committed to um, being a lot more sensitive to uh, a schedule based release. And so at six months, you get a new dot release. And that's why we're already coming up on 6.4 here in the next month or so. So core components wise, you know, anytime there's a major release, uh, the key things that most people are looking for is what version of the kernel. So when uh, 8.0 came out, uh, it was based on a 4.18 kernel. Um, anybody not familiar with Red Hat? The base kernel version essentially does not change after the GA release. So we're always gonna have kind of a 4.18 foundation. But part of what makes Red Hat unique is that we are able to backport a lot of features and, and new enhancements to the upstream kernel. We bring those back into the 4.18 kernel, but manage to maintain uh, KABI and API 
so that anybody who's gone through the certification process for building drivers or other software, um, they get some value out of the, the commitment that they make to uh, you know certify on this platform. Uh, system compiler by default 8.2 um, hardware architectures was a bit of a change because we're supporting ARM 64-bit out of the box. Uh, with RHEL 7, uh, ARM was was added later in the life cycle. I think it was around 7.5 7, or 7.6. Um, of course, what you don't see here is a 32-bit Intel anymore. 32-bit uh, Intel was also dropped, I think, in, in RHEL 7 already. Um, the def default file system is XFS. Um, this was a uh, decision also made in RHEL 7, so it did, there's, didn't get rid of EXT4. It's still there if, if that's something you want to use. Um, but we found uh, as an organization that you know the, the performance benefits and scale and such of XFS kind of made it the default file system. Um, so if you just do a default install, you get XFS. If you choose to do kickstart and change it, you can do so. That's not a problem there. Um, we'll talk a little bit about package management and YUM version 4, uh, which is based on DNF. If you're um, a Fedora user, you're probably familiar with DNF. Um, and then time synchronization, NTP daemon was uh, switched out uh, in favor of crony. Um, service management is still done with systemd. We'll talk about that in depth. And network management, um, the network manager took a more prevalent role. Um, so the old fashioned scripts to control your network interfaces are not part of the default build at this point. So kind of notable deprecations, things you should be aware of. Um, RHEL 7, you know, part of its big GA release was containers and of course Docker. Um, Docker has since been removed from the Enterprise, the Red Hat Enterprise Linux platform uh, and replaced with another set of tools called Podman. We'll talk about that in depth later. Um, IP tables, um, whoops, there's a spelling mistake there. So that should be say replaced by NF tables. So um, by default, you know, the I, I, IP tables is still around. NF tables provide some better value. We'll talk about that uh, as we go. Um, other basic administrative tools like Screen, which I used for decades, uh, has been replaced by another tool called Tmux. Uh, the, the Screen package is no longer compiled and, and shipped by Red Hat. And then another major change was uh, that X11 was replaced by uh, another uh, graphic rendering system called Wayland. So this list will grow, I'm sure, as I uh, you know do more of these presentations and folks bring up a few things. But uh, those are just the kind of the key things out the door that you know everybody should be aware of. Okay, so Yum version four um, in Rel eight, uh, they use the term Yum version four, even though the the back end is DNF. Um, but the reason they went with Yum four was to maintain much of the command line editing configuration file compatibility with previous versions of yum. So you're still using yum commands. The commands haven't changed. You could also use DNF commands if you choose to do so. Um, basic features of yum version four is uh, increased performance. And then what we're gonna talk about next is this modular content. So the ability to deliver um, different versions of particular packages onto the same system. Um, and then the, uh, a little bit of a, a better stable API for integration with, with additional tooling. So at the bottom, I've got a little footnote there that you know YUM version 3 plugins are incompatible with the new versions of YUM 4. But for the majority of those plugins, they've been ported over. So they have the same names and the same command line interpretations, but don't expect to take a, a literal YUM three plug in and just use it here. It won't work that way. Okay, so another one of the, the foundational changes was this introduction of app streams. So to all for all prior previous releases of, of RHEL, you basically had, um, I'll use the term repo because everybody's gonna be familiar with it. You had um, a, you know, a, a RHEL repo that represented kind of the, the base operating system. Um, and within that was the majority of all the packages that came with 
the product. So that would include Python and PHP and MySQL and such. Um, the, the problem within that model is that now greatly hindered the ability to upgrade the version of PHP and Python because they become a, a core component of the operating platform. What's happened now in RHEL 8 is this introduction of this app stream or um, a YUM module is that you can bundle software with a version tag. And when you install a version of, of MySQL or PHP, it uh, it sticks within that family of the version. So uh, if I install version four of one product in one app stream on one host, and I go to another host and install version five of that same same product, but you know it's a different stream. Now I go to each host and do a yum update. They'll stick within their own families and only update from that stream of the product. So that's what the you know the example down there uh, highlights is the PHP seven point two versus seven point three. Those are different app streams. And then on the command line, when you do a yum, you pick one or the other. And then when you do the yum install PHP, you, you get what you would expect. Um, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and point out that again, the the that the, this material is based on the hands-on workshop, and I'm going to guess that probably doing anything Yum related is probably not that exciting. I'll I'll get back to the right slide in a second. Um, oh, session terminated. Let's go ahead and do a quick. Um, what I was going to point out real quick is the GitHub for this workshop includes a lot of um, exercises for each one of these units. So if you wanted to work with uh, Yum and the app streams, for example, here's the app stream application delivery unit. This would basically go through the steps of connecting to a system and then how do you show um, make that a little bit lighter? So for example, the, the yum module list command, and then we, then we just grep for Postgres, for example, shows us that we've got three different versions of Postgres available as different streams. And then if you just do a yum install without any parameters, you get the one that's highlighted with the, the D, which is the default. And then if you go to another node here, we, we basically say, well, we want to install the 9.6 version server on this particular machine. So again, this is just to point out that the, the packaging within YUM version 4 is, is different, but it allows for a little bit more flexibility. Um, if you've had any experience in the past with other flavors of RHEL 6, 7, um, we used to also provide something called the software collections which had a similar effect, but basically installed multiple versions of the same tooling in different directories. And then when you access them, you basically had like a wrapper script that you would run ahead of time that would change, you know, library uh, um, loading paths. It would change uh, your, your binary search paths. And so basically create a unique environment so that when you ran the tool set, it used the right versions of the products versus using the stuff that came with the operating system. So this does not allow for multiple versions of the same product to be installed on the same host, but it does allow you to be more selective about which versions of those products do you want on a machine. And that way Red Hat can maintain um, basically different life cycles for each of those. And we can also create newer, uh, more cutting edge versions of those products and make those available without necessarily uh, creating disruption for your service, uh, for your system administrators. Okay, so that's the hands-on exercise. And let's jump back over here to the slides. If anybody has any questions, feel free to throw those in chat. I've, uh, I'll be able to bounce back and forth. You know, we're a small group. We should be able to take questions if anybody has any. Um, when you subscribe your machines, you will have to subscribe to two separate repos for basic system administration. So uh, your, 
your repos will have a base OS and a app stream component. OK, let's go back to presenting. So Web Console was another significant, um, I guess, investment in engineering and marketing for, for RHEL 8. Um, and it provides a web-based system administration interface. Um, you know, Linux in general has gone through a number of these web-based configuration uh, systems. Um, this is based on an open source project called Cockpit. And the web console basically provides you, you know, ability to maintain your software, install updates, manage user accounts, you know, uh, enable, disable, start, stop your system services. So a lot of the functionality as an administrator that you do on the command line are now accessible through the uh, cockpit um, web UI. Um, you can look at logs. You can manage your system subscriptions from here. And mostly, for me, benefit, especially like in a home lab environment, you can have a remote terminal. So let's pop over here. I'm going to give you an example of what the web console looks like. So when you deploy a RHEL system and you install Cockpit, uh, it starts a service on port 9090. So you'll see that in my URL, I basically have my my Bastion host that's part of my cluster from my hands-on workshop. Uh, I'm going to port 9090 on this machine. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and use the root, a root account here since this is a, uh, a workshop. And then this is what Cockpit looks like. So uh, there's a number of different plugins that you can also add to Cockpit. So for example, there's this dashboard. Uh, in the dashboard, you know, just basic you know, monitoring of your, of your system performance in various categories, but I can also add multiple servers to this machine. So from this perspective, I can install Cockpit on one host. I can provide access for myself or my admins to get to that one host. But then from here, I can connect to other machines in that network and basically interact with them the same way that I would if I had a direct connection to their Cockpit interface. So that's kind of cool with the, uh, the dashboard. Um, other things of note is virtual machine management. So I haven't created any virtual machines here, but you know if you've got a use case where um, you've built out a, a CentOS or RHEL machines in the data center, you don't have X11 or Wayland configured to provide you know a desktop. Well, just by turning on Cockpit, you can get virtual machine management here, where I can create a VM. I can get to the console. If the console's got a web UI running, I can get to the console right here in this dashboard. Um, and I'll, we'll probably have some opportunities to explore with this and, and show you how this works here uh, as we go a little bit later on. Um, there are plugins for managing containers. There's all kinds of plugins for things you can add to Cockpit to expand its capabilities. Um, you'll also notice that I can you know, go to my network tabs. And I've only got one network card in this machine. but I can also do very fairly complicated uh, network interface management where I can take two interfaces, bond them, uh, create an LACP type uh, bond and you know what have you. It's, it's pretty thorough. And because it's web UI based, it's, it's great for anybody who's not a command line, you know, Unix, Linux guy from, from the past. If you're a Windows based user or somebody else that needs a little bit more uh, a GUI of an interface, this is a, a great tool. All right. Um, last bullet point here is that the web console is also available in RHEL 7. Um, and there is quite a bit of similarity, especially when you get to the later releases of RHEL 7. Uh, RHEL 7 is already at 7.9. Um, the feature updates to RHEL 7 is going to slow down dramatically. Um, so, you know, it's not going to be feature parity. RHEL 8 is where Cockpit's really going to excel at this point. Oh, remote terminal. Yeah, don't forget about that one. Um, if you scroll down to the bottom, remote terminal. So I can get here, and since I'm logged in as root, I can pretty much do anything that I need to do on my host. I can run a tmux session here, create multiple shells, what have you, and then if this connection dies, I can jump back in and, and restart the session and pick up right where I left off. So very helpful. Um, and also, I think I've 
found out that um, if you have multiple users with the same permissions watching the terminal, then you're basically all sharing the same interface, which can be helpful, especially if you're trying to, you know, work a, a root cause scenario for a machine that's down or something. So anyway, okay, let's move on. So uh, system D. Um, is the init system for RHEL 8, so that's the same as it was for RHEL 7. Um, the transition there was made to move from um, the old-fashioned System 5 init scripts. Um, at the time, uh, RHEL 6 was using a, a project called Upstart, um, but as of 7, everything switched over to using System D. So primary benefits is you know service parallelization, so the ability to figure out when your system boots, <laughs> I'm already seeing the chat coming here. Um, when the system boots, that you can have multiple services start in parallel as opposed to everything just being kind of one after another in a very serial process. Um, it was and continues to be a, a somewhat controversial decision. Um, but by and large, you know, when we talk about the, the scale, and the you know the cloud and and virtualization containers and all the things that uh, you know Linux does now as an operating system, um, having a robust single daemon kind of being able to control everything uh, has been beneficial. Um, so let's see what else here. So on demanding starting of services, tracking services and child processes via C groups. So you know being able to create C groups to limit. Uh, resource consumption by processes, um, and then um, control um, security and et cetera of, of those processes as they go. So let's see, any thoughts, uh, System D? Yeah, I don't think anything is going to uh, to change with System D. In fact, the 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 things that it controls continues to expand, right? Because we used to have like uh, the init process. You know, you had your um, in our C scripts and you had X inet D that would watch ports and start services on demand. So a lot of those old fashioned services have all been consolidated under the system D umbrella. Um, let's talk about system B for a second. Let me uh, jump over to the workshop and just point out a few things that you probably would like to know. Um, in system D, You've basically got a couple of uh, directories. Let me just scroll down here and get to the directories or where they're at. So instead of calling everything a service like we would in init, um, in systemd, we use the term uh, a unit. And so your unit configuration files can be stored in multiple places dependent on if it's a um, kind of default unit file that comes from Red Hat, or you've made some changes to the defaults and you've created some, you know, some augmentation of, um, of those defaults. So all the default unit files go into user lib system D system. And that's where you, you know, you'll see everything that Red Hat ships. And if you do a, an, an update to your machine and it gets new foundational defaults, um, provided you've stored your changes in Etsy, System D system, then your changes would always, you know, take priority over the Red Hat defaults. Uh, but you can also just do uh, minor drop-ins. So by creating a drop-in configuration, you can make a small change to a larger default config file. For example, you just want to change where the port is, or if you're going to restart it always. So um, this exercise goes through uh, a bunch of examples of what you might do with system D. Um, and even since uh, system D was introduced in RHEL 7 and now in 8, you know, it continues to get a little bit more easier to work with. You can just do a, a system CTL edit on a service. And instead of having to create a directory, create a drop file, load the drop file, restart the service, like all these other steps you would have to go through to make a minor change. Now you can just basically go and say, edit the config file make your minor change, it'll create the drop-in. You can use the, the cat command to basically just dump out how system D is going to interpret the overall config and then see how, how it's running, right? So a lot of things that seem complex and especially you know when you 
when you have to deal with change and you don't understand that the, the directory structures and how the inheritance of defaults work, um, just being able to edit in the command line and, and do it on the fly, I've, I've found has been uh, very helpful. Okay. All right, next major topic. So I've been bit, bitten by this one several times already. Um, and I'm, you know, like much, Many people don't like the change of system D. I wasn't super happy about the network manager changes and the, you know, getting rid of the, the legacy scripts to manage your network interfaces. Um, in RHEL 7, you pretty much still had a, an option to install the old if config scripts. Um, it's worth pointing out that, um, hang on, let me make one change here. There's one too many lines there. All right, let's go back to presentation mode. So, with Network Manager, when you create a network interface, it still creates the traditional scripts in Etsy, sysconfig, um, network scripts, and you'll see the files, but they're all got the header in there that says, that, you know, this file was generated by Network Manager. So if you were to manually go into the scripts and make changes, um, they wouldn't persist, and you'd keep coming back to what Network Manager was configured with. Um, in RHEL 7, there's a package you could have installed uh, called the yum install network scripts that would then kind of disable network manager and let you use do things the old-fashioned way. Um, the same is true for RHEL 8, although I've written I've read language that basically says that the plan is to remove that network scripts bundle at some point. So I think the intent is to try and encourage people to start to use network manager more than not. Um, in any case, so when the system boots up, network manager is invoked. It basically configures and creates all the, the network connections. Uh, has an API through Dbus. Um, and the importance there is, is that because everything works through the API, you get consistent and accurate control of your network configuration. So you might have a command line tool, uh, a tool within cockpit, uh, another GUI-based tool, a remote management tool, um, as long as they're working through the API, it's consistent. So um, from the command line, you've got a couple of tools you can use. Uh, the NM TUI provides a, a console-based um, menu-driven interface for managing your network interfaces. Uh, NMCLI is more of a uh, grassroots, simple, bare bones uh, command line interface, uh, which is really good for uh, you know if you're trying to include it in scripting, um, in, in your shell scripts. Um, then there's a GNOME GUI, and of course Web Console can also manage your network interfaces. So, and I've already pointed out the um, the yum install network scripts if you want to really unlock the the old way of doing things. Um, one of the things that I've actually had great results and feedback on is Firewall D. So this was also introduced in RHEL 7. Um, Firewall D is a daemon that uh, kind of rides on top of IP tables in RHEL 7. And then IP tables and or, or not and or, IP tables or NF tables in RHEL 8. So Firewall D provides a dynamically managed firewall for enhanced network security. Um, it abstracts you, the user, from the underlying kernel layer, which is IP tables or NF tables. Um, so, you know, if you're familiar with IP tables and setting up firewall rules, right, you usually had a, a couple of chains, like the input chain, output chain, and, and you'd have to insert rules one by one by one. You would then dump the rules to a flat file. You would reload the rules to see if everything still worked. Um, it was a very cumbersome thing in the and also the fact that every time you unloaded the rules, there was always a, a, a pretty significant impact to any services that were running on the system because between the times that you're changing the rules, you know, the network either becomes available or it doesn't, um, uh, depending on how you write your rules. So with Firewall D, you get dynamic management of your firewall rule set. So it's still IP tables under the covers, but Firewall D and the way it manages its rules allows you to do simple changes, updates, without basically taking the entire network stack off, offline. Um, also supported um, both IPv4 and IPv6 settings uh, simultaneously. 
um, support for building Ethernet bridges. Um, if you get into more complex environments, especially like if you're doing virtualization where you've got uh, you know VMs running on the same machine, but they need their own network connectivity, um, whether it's a, a private network that's NATed or if it's a bridge network, you know, the more containers and VMs that you run in single host, the more complex your networks get. Uh, the introduction of zones uh, basically allows you to create rules that apply to multiple networks at the same time or to a single device. And it basically, it's more flexible in the way it implemented the rule set. Okay. Um, command line is firewall-cmd. Um, there's a, a GUI version for managing uh, your firewall as well, the um, firewall config. And then lastly, there's also a, a plugin for um, cockpit or the web console to manage rules from, um, from the web user interface as well. Uh, one thing worth pointing out that I didn't mention here, the firewall D configs basically allows um, uh, a packager, for example, uh, let's say you're packaging a web server like HTTPD, you can include a firewall rule set with your packaging that you then just load with the firewall command. So you can do a firewall command, enable HTTPD, and that would tell firewall D what ports you're on, what protocols to support, and then whether or not you want that service to be enabled or not. So it's a lot like it treats the firewall rule much more like a system D treats a, a unit or a service uh, that you would start up on the operating system. So easier to manage from a perspective of what's uh, what services do I and do I have rules here instead of looking at an IP tables list of here's just a list of ports and services or um, ports and protocols that we're watching for all right um, talked about this briefly but NF tables is a replacement for IP tables it's a new subsystem of the Linux kernel, which provides filtering classification of network packages, uh, packets. Um, and it's based on um, a network specific virtual machine. And you have a, a new NFT user space command line tool. So um, I'll pop back over to the exercises in just a second, but you'll see that there's a command line tool that basically does very similar behavior to how you managed your IP tables, but the config files, the options, all very different. So it is kind of a heavy lift to move from IP tables to um, NF tables. But if you're using firewall D and the firewall command line tool, the firewall dash CMD, um, then it's pretty much trivial. It's uh, you just you're still using firewall D to manage the rule sets, and you just replace one for the other and then you get much better performance out of, uh, the, of the newer tools here. So um, we'll talk about tracing in just a minute, but the key thing here is that if you are using NF tables, then you can also enable some of the, the BCC tools in uh, eBPF to do uh, better packet inspection and tracing. Um, okay, I already mentioned that last point, so good there. Uh, Christoph? Yeah. You did miss, uh, Michael asked, any plans to adapt network D that's part of system D? I do not know, but I'm going to make a note. I should have just made a blank slide at the back end here where I can just go type in questions. I kind so I'll have to double check. I kind of feel like that that may have happened in eight point three because eight point three um, finally. So we've had a, a, a notice of deprecation of the traditional kernel parameters that you pass to a machine to say 
you know, when the machine boots, IP equals IP address, network, netmask equals netmask. Like there was a bunch of kernel parameters we'd pass along. Um, uh, network manager has a different set of parameters. Like it's just IP equals and then a bunch of parameters that are separated by colons. So it's a different format. Um, but that might be just network manager. Okay. Let, let me, I'll, I'll just come back and double focus and double check on that. But I ran into this problem with 8.3 and, and the deprecation of the old kernel parameters. And it threw me for a loop for a couple of weeks while I tried to figure out why things weren't installing that had been installing for years. So, okay. Do, do, do. Um, basic features of NF tables. Um, it uses uh, lookup tables instead of this linear processing, um, a single framework for both uh, IPv4 and v6 protocols. Um, all the rules are applied uh, atomically versus fetching update stores, completing a rule set. Um, and then the API is also, you know, it's, it's a reoccurring theme that every service is being basically turned into an API to make it more manageable. Um, let's jump over to the documentation here and just take a quick look at NF tables and what it looks like to create and destroy um, some firewall rules. So um, just like with IP tables, right, there's a, a list alternative. So where you do IP tables dash uppercase L, you can just do IP, NF, NFT list tables, and then you see your chains. Um, and so adding a single rule, it's not super trivial, but you know, once you learn the, um, the parameters, it makes sense. Personally, I'd, prefer to do things just through a uh, firewall D. Um, so there's an example of creating a rule, verifying the rule, and then here at the end, we just delete a single rule. So these are all just kind of ad hoc rule. Um, examples of creating multiple rules at one time. So here we're using um, a bash syntax for basically looping through different parameters. And let's see, is there anything else here worth pointing out for real quick? Yeah. Since we're only doing a high level overview, I'm not gonna try and go too deep here. All right, so that's NF tables. Let me make sure there's any questions here. Okay. Uh, eBPF tracing. So the extended Berkeley packet filter, um, as I understand it, similar to system tap, uh, basically allows for dynamic kernel tracing without requiring a kernel module like system tap. So it's also been described to me as an in-kernel restricted virtual machine that basically allows you know limited access to functions, but you can write code that executes in kernel space. And so by doing that, um, you can get a lot of information and, and debug things. Um, the code is compiled into what's called EBF, eBPF bytecode. It runs through a verification process to ensure that it's not something that's gonna harm the existing running kernel. Um, if it's determined that it's safe, it executes it. If it's determined that it's not safe, then it basically safely just backs it out. So the BCC tools are a collection of bytecodes for eBPF that basically perform various tracing activities. So part of what Red Hat ships in the BCC tools includes things like TCP Life, Exec Snoop, um, XFS slower, and these are only some examples that we use in the hands-on lab to kind of show how you can inspect various subsystems of the, of the current host. Um, like for example, XFS slower, you can just basically watch a, uh, a block device to see what operations run slower than a particular threshold. 
and then identify issues and then continue to run other commands to further identify like what might be happening on the box. Um, so there are networking snoops, file system snoops, and then trace here is kind of the Swiss army knife um, to trace various uh, system messages, um, kernel, and, uh, and print those out to the screen. So we have a, a bunch of exercises that go through basic steps. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, Carl, he's actually written a, an interesting blog. I should put that in the in the resources here that goes through a situation of trying to identify a network problem and how he used these tools to track down and, and identify those issues. Okay, so next, let's jump to Podman. So with the introduction of uh, RHEL 7, big news at GA was that uh, Podman was part of our tool set. Um, since then, uh, Docker Inc. has gone through some changes. Uh, their code base has gone through some licensing changes. Uh, the community has gone through a bunch of changes and whatever the reasons are, uh, Red Hat's put its momentum behind a, another set of tools called Podman. Uh, we'll talk also about Builda and Scopio, but basically the kernel I'm sorry, the container tools um, that we use are based around Podman, Scopio, and Builda. So with containers in general, right, there's a number of different subsystems uh, that are used to implement containers securely, um, namely control groups for resource management, uh, kernel namespaces for process isolation, uh, SE Linux for security, and then, um, you know, being able to have multiple containers running on the same host for multi-tenancy, having that also being done in a secure way. So um, Podman is a drop-in replacement for Docker. So the commands will be very similar and should have all the same functionality, but uh, it also removes the need for the Docker daemon. So again, that's that addresses the... Um, the multi-tenancy and the uh, the need for having a, a process run as root to, to manage everything. Um, let's hop over to the documentation tool set real quick. Here's a very a simple set of exercises for you know getting familiar with Podman. If anybody's messed with uh, Docker in the past, right? Anywhere we see. Podman, you, you used to do Docker info and you would get information about how the host is configured, what resources available, et cetera. Um, Podman images would show you what uh, container images you've already got in your local registry. Um, you would do a pull to pull, in this case, we are, um, I'm, I'm pulling down what's called the universal based, uh, universal image, universal based image from Red Hat. Um, and this is a, uh, a Red Hat based container that's free for consumption. So if you're a developer and you want to build, but you don't necessarily want to use CentOS or you don't want to use uh, Ubuntu or Canonical, um, you can get the UBI image. Uh, there's no charge. You can use it, uh, distribute it. And then if it comes around to where uh, somebody wants to get support on it, um, you can get support from Red Hat for it. So in any case, this particular lab uses the UBI image to pull down the image um, and then deploy like a hello world using that image. And then we also make some changes to the image um, through these exercises. So that's containers and Podman. Does anybody have any questions there? No Docker in RHEL 8. Okay. So now my slides get kind of vague because I didn't have a chance to, to finish these today. But uh, Builda and Scopio add to the creation and maintenance of containers in, in RHEL 8. And, and these tools are also available in RHEL 7. Um, let's go back to presentation mode. Actually, now let's go over to, this, to the workshop. So Builda is a set of tools to basically create containers. And let me go back to the front. So 
So what you would do uh, with Builda, for example, is you use the command line and you specify the container image that you're going to work from. It unpacks the container, creates a local directory for you. You can then um, add your own content to it, and then you basically compile it back together and build a, a new container image out of that. Um, you can do basic tool, uh, basic functionality, like if, if the host is registered with a local repo, uh, you can do yum install of packages into the container image. Um, you can change the entry point, like if, uh, you know, how, if you, if you install a daemon into the image and need that to run when the uh, container image is called, uh, you know, simple steps like this, this is all part of what Builda does. Um, and then Scopio is an inspection tool that basically helps you determine um, what's in the container image that you just built. So this is more focused on security and checksums and things of that nature, but you can inspect the container and see what's inside. All right, and so those tools also included with uh, seven and eight. All right, so then uh, KVM and basic libvirt-based uh, virtualization. So um, to run my test environment, um, I'm using the Red Hat virtualization, our upstream project called Overt. So I'm using Overt to run my virtual machines here. So this is, I've got multiple nodes that are tied together with a shared storage um, uh, solution uh, using iSCSI. And so I can just deploy VMs and they go onto whichever node has the least amount of resources consumed, et cetera. Um, that's the enterprise virtualization solution. If you're just trying to use local-based virtualization, that's what I refer to as libvirt. So um, using the web console, I can see you know, that I don't have any virtual machine here. Um, what I can do, let me just go ahead and go to the documentation real quick and let's see how complicated the steps are to build a virtual machine. Include VMs. I haven't tested this in a while, so I want to make sure that uh, it's not all these things should already be installed, but let's go ahead and just run it for a second here. All right, so it's all already there now. Okay, so this also points out another set of tools that have been installed here called the Lorex Composer, or also as the Image Builder. This is a set of tools that will build a, a virtual machine in various formats, depending on how you, how you specify you want the output. Like if you're gonna go deploy something in, in uh, AWS or into VMware, the outcome of the image that you're going to create might be different, but you basically create a, um, a blueprint of what you want in the image, and then you call the image builder to go create the image. And so what this exercise here does is it, um, uh, oh, this is rel 8.3. I haven't updated yet. It changed names. It's not called the Lorax Composer anymore. All right, so this demo is going to have to wait. So yeah, so a few things changed in 8.3, but the uh, the packages are installed. I just haven't updated the instructions for, for doing it. So libvirt kvm, um, this is where you're gonna be using uh, command line tools like versh, and you can see there's nothing installed here. Um, but if I go to, oh, let's do something cool here. One second, let me go to some other machine. All right, so this is a, a set of resources that I use to, to fiddle with. Uh, this is kind of work related, but this is a single machine running um, a number. Uh oh, I'm not root, that's fine. Hang on. All right, let's try this again. So 
So I've got a, a handful of machines that are running. Uh, there's actually an OpenShift cluster running on this machine. There's another machine that's doing some work with CentOS and et cetera. So this is kind of a, like a lab space that we have uh, that we share among, um, among my colleagues. Um, but this is all local KVM based virtualization. It's all housed within this one host. So all that's part of RHEL 7, RHEL 8, and it's accessible and managed through cockpit now. Anybody have any questions on that? All right. Um, other neat features about RHEL 8, uh, T-Log. So T-Log is a session logging utility. Um, let's probably just jump over here, look at the workshop. Uh, documentation includes T-Log. So when T-Logging is enabled, um, anybody that connects to the host will get a message. Session logging is enabled. And then anything that they do is recorded and stored. And then depending on how you set it up, you can save those logs in a centralized location that can be used for, you know, like a data lake if you're going to search for activity or try to put together a, um, um, a history of how things may have changed on a host and, and who might have done those activities. Um, it's a tool that you, let's see, let's see if I can do this test real quickly. So. Let's go over to node one. So let's say to node one. don't have my message, so it doesn't look like it's been configured. All right. Maybe we'll do um, more in-depth demos of, uh, of these uh, functionalities uh, at a future point. I don't want to get hung up trying to make this run. Uh, but basically, any activity somebody does gets recorded. It's stored in the, in the uh, system journal. Uh, you can then pick it out through various uh, tags in the journal so that you can find out where, where the chunks of the record are. And then there's a, a playback command that you can run. And basically, you'll just see as people are typing what they're doing. It's almost like uh, pulling back a, an old tape or a, a video of you know somebody typing on the command line. So you can see in time what was typed, what was seen, you know, if they type the command and, and backed up to to make a, an update or an edit or something like that, you'll see all the keystrokes that uh, that got them to their command. So that's T-Log. OK, um, LVM and VDO. So logical volume management, which deals with storage and uh, virtual data optimization. Uh, these are tech, so LVM has been in Linux for a very long time. Uh, but VDO was introduced to um, RHEL 7 and RHEL 8 by default. Um, that is um, data optimization. So think of compression and deduplication. Um, these are It's just a, a, a module that you would load on top of your logical volume and enable deduplication. Uh, again, the, the workshop has the steps you go through to enable it. Let's pop to the bottom. I can show you basically what it looks like. So this uh, top of the example is just a very simple um, logical volume management, setting up a, a RAID, you know, a mirror, RAID 5, et cetera. Um, but then VDO, which is a, a decent value, right? Because you know, deduplication is as our consumption of data continues to grow, the ability to deduplicate that and kind of uh, save some space is uh, is valuable. So how do you set it up? Um, 
we do a little cleanup here, create a new volume. So PV, so from the, from the ground up, um, using uh, virtual disk devices. So in this example, uh, we're on a virtual machine using KVM with vert IO based block devices. So the device names have V instead of S. Um, and so we you do a PV create on these uh, four devices, create our volume group, and then we create our logical volume of type RAID. And, um, and then we add the video deduplication layer on top of that using the video create command. Um, and then you put on your file system, create your directory, mount it, and you're good to go. So then when we do our little sample data things, we basically copy the same sample data set 100 times into the directory. And you'll see in real time how the data consumption grows and then kind of shrinks back to a minimum set of, of, um, of, of blocks consumed. So that's part of RHEL as well, if you've never seen that before. Um, if you think all that was complicated because you had to learn PV, LV, and all these other commands, um, RHEL 8 introduced a command called Stratus. And here, Stratus is a single command that performs multiple storage um, functions under one umbrella. We had a, a different command in RHEL 7, but its community kind of ran into some dead ends. And so uh, Stratus became the new playground for this single tool to kind of rule them all. Um, I think the other one was called System Storage Manager or SSM uh, in RHEL 7. So that was Stratus. Um, boom, that was new to RHEL 8. So this is a simplified boot or Grub2 management system. I'm gonna go ahead and defer back over to, uh-oh, that's not supposed to happen. Let's go to documentation, include. Okay, so in this scenario, the way, if, if you're familiar with uh, with Grub2, um, unlike Grub1, where you had a, you know, Etsy grub.conf config file, you went and made a couple of changes, great. Uh, with Grub2, there's a, more of a make adjustments to your config and then compile the config to create your active config approach to things. Um, it could lead to problems where if you made mistakes, it could render your system unbootable, even though you have multiple entries, et cetera. So the opportunity for error was, uh, was greater. Um, and so the way Boom works is it basically ins inserts a, more of a, a plugin approach um, to where you have a single entry for Boom, and then you can have directories with Boom configs that then allow Grub to figure out what your system's going to boot with. So this ease of managing the, the boot interfaces allows you to, for example, what we do here is um, we create a snapshot of a running system and then make a quick boot entry using Boom to basically reboot the system to the snapshot and then kind of go back and forth between uh, you know, a system from the future and a system from the past. Um, very handy. It's it's a lot for, for me as an administrator, it's easier for me to understand how this works as opposed to Grub2. Um, full screen, please. Do, do, do. Is that old or new? From about 11 minutes ago. Yeah, oh, okay. You gotta speak up so I can I can make that change right away. Um, okay, let's see. Do, do, do. So this exercise creates a file on an updated system, and then we regress back to the previous snapshot of the root, root volume, utilizing our boom created grub2 entry. So in the event of, you know, this, this isn't the perfect showcase for, I'm gonna apply a bunch of patches on my system, but I want a, a back out solution, but it does kind of set the template for how you can make that, uh, 
uh, make that procedure using boom and snapshots and then also the uh, LVM uh, snapshot merging to basically move a file system back to a uh, consistent state. Um, what's left? Wayland. So X11 is gone. Uh, it's still available as optional packages. But let's go here to the Wayland module. just to see what we need to talk about here. So um, if you're not familiar with uh, System D, the means to change your system to a graphical mode, like what we used to do, um, changing the init mode, I think it was five was, was graphical, right? In the old System 5, in the SysV5 days. Um, now you use the system CTL isolate to set the graphical mode for your current running system. And then if you want to make sure that that's persistent across reboots, you also then set to default. So you would install the packages for Wayland, then you would run the system CTL commands to set your system to graphical mode, um, and then you're good to go. So, um, let's see. You know, I've heard a lot of reasons why Wayland versus X11. Um, I think X11, the, the, the biggest, I guess the motivation to ditch X11 is because there was an enormous amount of baggage that came with it of uh, tools that people didn't use anymore. Um, you know, just consider all the font and things that, that show up with X11. Um, but I'm not a contributor community member in here, so I don't want to get into politics on why one's better than the other. Um, but in any case, Wayland's out, X11's still there if you need it, but it's something you have to go install. Um, let's see. So the other thing is, is that the, the desktop is very different. And so as an exercise, what we do here is we go through and install the ma the modules to basically make the Wayland desktop appear more like the old fashioned desktop. So it's still gonna be GNOME, but not. It takes a little bit of getting used to. I don't spend too much time in the user interface, so. Christoph? Yes. I uh, put it in the chat. So how close is Wayland to providing a remote desktop? I know that's been a topic. I don't know. I'll find out. I would love to have that to be able to sit in my living room and remote access my remote lab in the basement. Have you considered using cockpit? I will be adding that. I've forgotten about that one. Yeah, I, I mean, if you need the GUI from the server itself is one thing, if you're just wanting to get to the, 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 the GUI of VMs, for example, like that cockpit's got nailed. I don't think the terminal would give you a graphical desktop of the system that it's running on. Uh, is, is, it, uh, is it compatible with X11? Is what compatible with X11? Is Wayland compatible with X11 in the sense that uh, if the, if the, if the remote server is running Wayland as his uh, GUI, and uh, my my machine at home happens to run X11, and I SSH into the uh, server that's running Wayland, can I run a uh, an application on the uh, I, can I run a graphical application on that server and have it display on my local machine, which is running X11, or would it have to be running Wayland uh, on my uh, machine? Uh, I'm gonna guess no. But that's a guess. Does anybody else here on the phone have any experience there? So Wayland does have an X11 um, client. So if you run an application that requires X11, then it can still display on a Wayland system. But you can't do that across the network as of yet, so far as I can tell. Hmm. 
So that uh, will still be needed until that uh, until Ahmed Shali gets in there. Yeah, I keep on looking for that, but I haven't found it yet. So I find that a critical functionality. Yeah. That's probably why uh, X11 has, hasn't been removed altogether. But yeah. I, mean, I, I have multiple servers here in my living room in my, in my house, and I, I have graphic applications I run on those that I display on my desktop. If Wayland can't support that, then uh, Wayland's no good to me. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm looking for, too. Okay. Um, I'll see what I can find out. Good questions. So that's kind of the the, the overview of topics that I had for today. Um, I'm going to continue to fill out my little sheet here of quick little overviews and kind of quick hits. Um, the link to the hands-on workshops up here at the top. Mm -hmm. um, anybody have any other things about RHEL 8 or, you know, that needs to be included or should be included? Or do you think you sent me a copy of the slides to post on the blue website? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, you had a bunch of slides that hadn't been filled in yet. Uh, were you going to fill those in first? or uh, I am going to fill those in first, absolutely. Okay, so um, I'll look yeah, like five to go. So, yeah, uh, five, I think, yeah. Shouldn't be that much. Shouldn't, these these aren't that difficult because I this is the content that I have in the workshop. I just need to extract like the overview and, and put a couple examples in there. Okay, and slightly off topic too. Um, Jerry told me that you sent me an email on Saturday with uh, the abstract for your talk. I never yeah. see that. I never... He sent it to. Uh, he sent it to uh, replied. He replied to me. Yeah, I did a reply all and I went to Jerry. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. So I, I sent you that information, Jammer. Okay. I was worried there was something broken in my email because Jerry was telling me that he, you sent it to me and I never received it. But if yeah, you just sent it to Jerry, then I guess that's not an issue. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I can't think of anything else right now. Um, okay. So unless anybody's got any other questions or thoughts, we can conclude the presentation, but I'm still willing to hang out and talk if you like. Hey, Chris Christoph, do you, Christoph, do you have any insights into the new Epic, uh, the Epic three processors? I know, I know Red Hat doesn't um, necessarily target processors. Um, but, uh, but do you know if there's any particular good fit there? No. I, I've been watching YouTube as much as anybody else and seeing all the, the new numbers that are coming out. So I just I just built a new system for myself here, but I'm I'm only using the um what was it the Ryzen nine thirty nine fifty X, so it's a sixteen core processor workstation category, but I think I bought my system a week early because about the prices are probably gonna drop here in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Until yeah. AMD are going at it again. I know I know AMD pays some of their employees to work on GCC, but I don't know if they they tell them to work on particular distros. Yeah. Uh, but but some of those some of those presentations were really impressive. I mean, they've got 64 core uh, processors coming out now. That's that's going to be really interesting. Yeah. And at a at a reasonable thermal package too, right? The the, the power consumption is not off the charts. I love my little AMD boxes here for, you know, 100 watts. You get 16 cores doing three and a half gigahertz. It's not bad. Somebody's echoing here. Okay. Um, Jabber, I'll finish up my uh, slides here in the next day or so. I'll send you a copy. Okay, that'd be great. Thanks. And, and Jabber, I'll download the uh, YouTube uh, when it's available. Usually uh, 
isn't available and for about 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so my questions I have to answer is how close is Wayland to providing a remote desktop? I'm definitely going to find that answer. And then network D in system D. And Christoph, to clarify that network D, my understanding is that network D is comparative functionality to network manager. Uh, Christoph, I see two different ways of doing desktop, uh, remote desktops. Yeah. Some people probably uh, here. Uh, I think some people here in remote desktop, and I think like VNC. But uh, the way I when I when I'm doing remote uh, the remote stuff, uh, what I'm doing is uh, I do I do I get SSH to remote server in the terminal window, and then I run a graphic application on the remote end to display on my local end. Yeah, you're doing X11 forwarding, right? But that's completely separate from uh, different from uh, VNC. Yeah, I do that to. Uh... I, I do that. I run Wayland on my home desktop, and when I log into BLU, I do that. In that case of what Jabber wants to do, um, doesn't that just require the X11 client libraries to be installed in the remote end? You're so. not running an X11 desktop on the remote end. The, the desktop is on the X11 server, which is uh, on the machine that you're on. Yep. So... That's just a matter of installing the libraries on the target operating system, I would think. Right. That means I'm not running Wayland on a remote end at all. I'm just running the XO libraries. Yeah. 